Um, it's been an amazing day with a fantastic arc of conversation. And we're, we're wrapping up with a future Blue Skies tech panel. Uh, here in Bristol, we, we love the future. We're, we're always thrusting forward. In fact, we're so far in the future that even my banners are out of date. And thank you to everybody that pointed that out to me. I'll do better next time. Um, so our chair for this final panel is Professor Dave Cliff at the University of Bristol, um, academic director for the new Temple Quarter Enterprise Zone. Um, campus. Campus, yeah. sorry. Campus, Temple, uh, and, uh, academic campus. Um, Dave has a distinguished track record in the high-tech sector, both in academia and in industry, and also in the financial services. So we're really honored to have him looking after this panel um, of, uh, to close the session. Um, so I shall hand over to Dave and our Blue Skies panel. Thanks very much, John. Um, we're painfully aware that this is the last session between you and the bar. So uh, we're not going to overrun. Um, we, uh, John's asked me to, to try and uh, provoke a lot of conversation with the, uh, with the audience, so we're going to do that. Um, as John said, I, I've got a background, so though I've been an academic for the past 12 years, before that, I, like one of the previous panellists, was working for Deutsche Bank. And in fact, I, uh, like the question that Pete asked, was trading complex derivative uh, and optimising them. And Pete, it wasn't immoral, it was just lucrative. Um, and 20 years ago, I invented some automated trading technology that got quite popular. Um, but that's another story. So we're joined today by Duncan Pauley from Edge Intelligence, uh, by Krasina Mileva from Dovu.io, yeah, OK? And then by Peter Rogers from, uh, from 1060 Research. Um, Edge intelligence does what it says on the tin. Yeah? It puts uh, the computation at the edge of the network rather than, rather than at the center. Dovu is a distributed ledger or blockchain-based company. And Pete at 1060 Research is it's a matter of record. He is the person who was first on record as talking about microservices and microservice architectures. And over the last, what, 15 years has developed that into kind of resource-oriented computing and doing microservices pro properly, I think. They'll all say more about themselves, because that's what I've asked them to do. So I'm now going to shut up. Um, I'm going to ask each of them to give a brief introduction to who they are, what they do, and then to say something provocative about the future of FinTech or TechFin, starting with Duncan. Hi there. Um, well, in interest of full disclosure, I know diddly squat about FinTech. Um, but I do dick about with technology, so maybe that helps. <laughs> um, uh, as Edge Intelligence, we actually push uh, computing and also storage towards the edge of the network. So we're all familiar with cloud computing, and as technology develops and get into the Internet of Things and Industry 4.0, then there's a lot more be data being generated at the edge of the network, uh, and you have to process that in real time and deal with it. A lot of data exhaust being generated there. You can't suck it all back into the cloud. So we provide a platform which allows you to disperse that data. And now for something provocative. Okay, capitalism is dead. Um, <laughs> ultimately, whichever way you look at it, if we assume that automation is going to come along in the way that it's proposed to come along, uh, then the way that everybody works is going to change. In fact, we don't work so much. We don't work at all. Um, and even uh, that, that then undermines capitalism. It undermines uh, fiat currency, as we understand it, potentially, uh, and even the universal basic income. What is that about? Is that just a, a rationing mechanism for resources? I don't know. So fundamentally, things are going to change radically, and we actually all need to think differently. Fantastic. What I've actually asked all the panellists to do is to say something provocative, and we're going to go along the line, because as, as you may have just noticed, it would be quite easy to just fall down the rabbit hole of the first thing that gets said, especially when it's as, as general and wide-ranging as that. So, Krasina, if you'd like to go next. Um, hello everyone, it's uh, great to be here, it's really great that Dovu is um, attending this event. Um, when we've got the invitation, all of us ask ourselves, why us, because we're not experts on fintech at all. Uh, my background, um, I'm a corporate lawyer, but for the past four years I shifted and I've started working into the uh, tech industries and now, uh, now I'm one of the founders of Dovu, which is um, a cryptocurrency for the mobility space. Uh, so um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what we do and what we're aiming to do. Um, we're aiming to use blockchain as a mechanism that records um, 
all the transactions that are happening within our ecosystem. So when someone has, um, let's say, um, provided or had decided to sell some data and then they've been rewarded for that data, then this transaction is recorded in the blockchain, in the ledger. So um, in line with the topic today, Blue Skies Finance, um, and in line with something provocative, um, we've all heard that blockchain is the new disruptor. We've all heard that um, cryptocurrencies are the next big thing. I do believe that they are. Um, if we take a step back and think about just the question, why do we need more than probably hundreds different currencies to interact internationally and just pause there. And then if we take a step forward and then think of what would blockchain and cryptocurrencies change moving forward. Uh, if we think about digital currencies, uh, if we think about how we trade digitally in general, peer-to-peer -peer interactions, then we're ending up with the answer of, isn't that the new paradigm shift of business and finance in and the way business works. Okay, another provocative th statement there. Uh, by the way, this th in the uh, in the program, this session was labelled quantum finance, uh, <laughs> and uh, I don't know anything about quantum computing. There's a there's a cat in a box, and I fear for its future, and that's all I know. <laughs> but but Pete, Pete has a PhD in quantum something. Quantum mechanics. Yeah. Quantum mechanics. Exactly. So. Exactly. Say something I'm, I'm only people. half here, so. <laughs> <laughs> both alive and dead. Oh, yeah, simultaneously. <laughs> um, Dave and I used to work together. In fact, we were in the s opposite cubicles. We had a wall about that high between our cubicles, and we used to lob um, in similar facetious comments <laughs> to each other over the fence every day. Um, yeah, I spun out from HP re uh, HP's research labs up the road in Filton uh, 15 years ago, and I've been a startup. Um, doing this technology in Chipping Sodbury, surprisingly. So it's a, it's a local technology. And what I did was I realized that um, this is my controversial thing, and I'm going to put it up front, which will be controversial. <laughs> so uh, software is a heap of shit, basically. <laughs> Whenever you look at software and software systems, you realize that it's the ambition of what you're trying to build is like trying to build a bridge across an estuary and we're using this material and it's a bit like Meccano. It's extremely fiddly and it's very, very intricate and the guys who are great at Meccano love playing with Meccano but actually the, int the information problem we're trying to solve is much larger than the scale of the tools they're using to solve the problem. And so you end up with um, an idea and an ideal of what you're trying to build, and you all aim for it, but you never quite know what it is you're trying to build, because software is abstract and the ideas are abstract. And so you learn as you go. But mechanic, uh, Meccano is very brittle. And as you put the Meccano together, you learn more and more about what the problem is, and you realize, shit, it doesn't fit the problem. And you paint yourself into, you can't paint yourself into a corner of Meccano, but you know what I mean. You, you end up with a system that just cannot solve the problem you set out to do. And then what do you do? You throw it away and you build another one. That is absolutely fucking insane, right? Because we're taking all our intellectual capital that we've invested in learning about the problem and we abandon it and we build another one. And typically you build three or four before you've got it what you want. And that is madness. Think about the amount of effort. In fact, the entire software industry lives on that uh, mismatch because there's a whole load of people who are like aphid farmers milking the system to take that money out of the system. And I saw this and I went, that's insane. There's got to be a better way of doing it. And that's what I set out to do. Okay. Thank you very much. Three, um, three uh, uh, provocative things there, one of which ladled with profanities. Thank you very exactly. much. Uh, exactly. Indeed. See? I wasn't I expecting thought, that. I thought, I thought the, bar, long time. the bar will be open soon. <laughs> get away with it. Let's imagine it's already open. Okay, so I think in, in, in terms of fintech, I mean, um, Christina's point about blockchain, it's clearly, it's been the, you know, blockchain and distributed ledger technology in general does seem almost to be no longer the future, but really the, the current transition that the industry is going through. Um, 
So I, I wonder, Christine, do you want to say a little bit more about that and then we'll, we'll perhaps see, see if there's any comments from, from the audience? Yeah, sure. Um, it's, it's, to be fair, it's been an interesting year uh, since we started the business. Um, it's been great to have interactions with various individuals, all of which have been really keen on using cryptocurrencies for, for various purposes. Um, purposes such as why do you need to have a um, price in dollars and if you think of it, you live in China and you want to pay for a product that is in the UK and that product, let's say, costs two dollars. It's insane to think about the conversion that, well, one, the travel that you're going to have to go through to convert two dollars into whatever the relevant amount of pounds is to buy that product. And then if we think a bit further, if we expand that, um, why do you even need to exchange that? Why do we need so many various currencies? And, and the great thing about cryptocurrencies is that you have one uni unified, crypto one unified currency that you can use all across the borders in every single business, in every single area. And then if we take it another step further, thinking about regulation and, and banking system and, and a, We've heard a lot of conversations today about transparency and visibility, and we don't have that nowadays. Although we all speak about KYCs and AMLs and, and processes in place, we don't actually, it's, it is apparent that we don't actually know what's the movement of those money in general. So if you have a blockchain, then you have all that movement stamped onto that ledger. So there's the visibility there, there's the trust, there's the transparency. So I believe that this changes a lot, the way we interact. So is the proposal essentially for cryptocurrencies as moving towards a universal one, you know, global currency metric? Yeah. Yeah? It, okay. It's Nothing major then? No. <laughs> okay. I used to be an FX trader, so uh, I, I, please God let it never happen. Um, so uh, any comments or questions on that? Where are we on the on the on the kind of hype hype cycle, the hypometer with cryptocurrencies? It seems you know, it reminds me, you know, the the uh, every, another day, another ICO at the moment. It reminds me of 1999 and the dot com boom. Uh, so maybe there's you know, maybe the, this rash of initial coin offerings is going to generate immense wealth for lots of people, but maybe some people are going to get burnt on the way down. Who knows? Um, any questions? Any comments on cryptocurrencies, distributed ledger technology? So I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm afraid I'm a skeptic. Uh, you put me on the panel, I'm okay. a skeptic. Do you want me to say why I'm a skeptic? Yeah, Without I'm swearing. I'm interested to yeah. hear why. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no rude words, I think. I've got it out of my system. Okay. Now. okay. So, um, yeah, I think there's a, there's a again, it gets some, somewhat towards the ethical question that we had earlier. Mm -hmm. there's, a, um, there's a technical underpinning to the distributed ledger that essentially requires proof of work. And the proof of work is essentially expenditure of energy. Mm -hmm. And it's just insane mm -hmm. to burn all that energy to, to move money. And it just doesn't make any sense. And yet there are mechanisms that you can use which are essentially putting authority in somebody who is a government or somebody that says, actually, we will have a basis of trust through oversight by this system. Mm -hmm. And that eliminates the energy cost. And so I think it's mm -hmm. immoral. Yes. Interesting point. Well, there, they are developing. So, sorry, a okay. quick point. So, uh, yeah, proof of work is very expensive. I mean, mm. there are proof of stake and proof of capacity. And I think uh, there's a, a new, another network, which is uh, IOTA, which is designed to be much more yeah. scalable, um, right. which doesn't require all of that energy. And I think there's a lot of work going on to, mm. into different platform structures. So, yes, what we have at the moment is horribly wasteful. Yeah. I think it will improve. Um, and yeah. like all technology, you know, people start out with a, an initial idea. It's a bit crap. Mm -hmm. But it evolves, it gets better. There's an audience there. Yeah, um, this is mainly from the, the legal aspect on ICOs and maybe uh, paraphrasing what Preston Byrne, a, a, a former colleague of mine, but uh, a commentator on, on crypto, uh, blockchain, DLT and, and ICOs, would say is whilst ICOs, and for those who don't know it, um, they are essentially a, a token-based um, equivalent of uh, fundraising that is has loose similarities to IPOs, for which will which more people will recognise. Um, but what you are seeing is 
uh, huge amounts of money being raised um, through ICOs with very little or no uh, regulation and accountability in return for something question questionable being held by those those people to whom you're selling um, who perhaps do not have the sophistication required to understand the technology and um, uh, and the projects that they're investing into. Um, so the bear case for ICOs is that uh, at its most extreme, it all comes crashing down because you get um, the SEC and the FCA and um, serious fraud office uh, just launching dawn raids left, right and center all at the same time. Um, a less ap apocalyptic view is that uh, you might just have elements of regulation starting to, to come in that forces uh, ICO fundraisers to, uh, to start uh, regulating more heavily. Um, or, or there's the do-nothing approach and then maybe it all works itself out. But I think that's something that maybe needs to be considered by the, the blockchain community. Uh, as a whole, just as a comment, sorry, a bit long. Okay, yeah, thanks, no, Christina. I totally agree with you, and, and I think it's ludicrous. Um, if you take a look at what ha has happened for the past year, it's crazy. It's a bunch of people that have drafted a 10-pager of a marketing piece that's not underpinned by any technology, and they have raised 20, 30, 100 millions of dollars for nothing. And then a lot of them have disappeared. So I completely agree with your comment, but at the same time, I'm really happy that regulators are actually working towards what do we do with those token sales and those ICOs because they can see that that's the future and this is where the economy is going. So instead of banning it, such as China, for example, well, they had another reason for banning ICOs, but I'm not going to go into that today. Um, and North Korea, for example, they are the other country that banned ICOs. All the rest are actually looking into regulating that, putting it into perspective, so it can work in a regulated and safe manner for everyone. So you can easily have KYC and AML in, in a token sale, which is what we did, because we've decided that although there is no legal requirement for us to do it, it's the right thing, because we want to know who are the people that are investing in our business. We don't want to be money laundering from ISIS or whatever else and then if you put those measures there although you're not required to do it i think then as a business you have done your job but there's definitely a lot of work to be done moving forward and and we see it happening yeah i think it's um it is a bit like the dot com mm. about to go bust uh, if you look at where uh, the blockchain is on the Gartner Emerging Technology Hype Cycle, it's right at the top at the moment, yeah. just mm -hmm. about to head into the trough. Mm -hmm. And it may be something like uh, lots of ICO, ICOs going bust. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe that, that's going to be part of it. Um, but we've got to differentiate the, the, the value of a currency from the underlying distributed ledger technology, mm -hmm. which is yeah. absolutely key and, and is really the disruptor. Uh, on the currency side, um, Another interesting thing is how long is it going to take for Amazon to actually come up with their own cryptocurrency? They're actually working on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry for interrupting. <laughs> exactly. So they've been buying up lots of cryptocurrency related domain names quite recently. Mm. Um, so I think that's going to happen fairly soon. Um, and we know that Amazon want to own the infrastructure of the world. Hell, they, they pretty they, much do. Well, yeah, and they also even want to own the infrastructure of space. I mean, we look at what Blue Origin is designed to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's just a matter of time before they actually get into the game. And once Amazon is in the game, it's not going anywhere. Yeah. It's, it's staying. Okay, so um, with the observation that there's an ICO investor born every minute, uh, we could move on to uh, perhaps to... Um, to the software side of things, I mean, so certainly uh, the conversation in the previous panel looked at the ethics of the, the, the kind of financial organisations that are developing technology. But, but Pete, you've, you've essentially got a view on what it is to be a tech developer. Yeah, so um, so, tech, so, so software, it feels like it's an established, mature engineering discipline um, because we essentially using it every day for solving complex problems. 
but in fact, if you look at it with an eye on history, uh, the, the reason it's interesting is computer science is very funny as a discipline in that it's taught sort of almost by cherry picking and things are just taught. Whereas other s sort of more mature, longer, longer period uh, subjects are taught almost as a history. So physics, you kind of learn the history of it and then they say, well, this is now quantum mechanics. But you couldn't start with quantum mechanics because you wouldn't get your head around it. Whereas you can start with object-oriented programming and you don't have to know anything about Lisp or, um, you know, um, lexical scope yeah. versus, uh, versus other, other forms of scope, dynamic scope. All those things that were in the foundations of computer science that actually, if you have some idea of it, give you some basis for a judgment. And so with a little bit of view on the history of it, you see that what we are at in the world of software is very much a guild form of manufacturing. In fact, it's not manufacturing, it's guild production, where you have groups of people trained very similarly in a, in a complementary set of technologies. So it could be a language and a framework within a language. And they're interchangeable as people, but in fact, organiz organizationally, they are, can produce you know, um, Java stuff or they can produce Python stuff, or they can produce JavaScript stuff. But um, that's a bit like being a goldsmith, or a silversmith, or a coppersmith. You know, you're great at gold, you're great at copper, you're great at silver. But what happened in the early 19th century was we realized that's a terrible way of scaling economically, because what you need to have is um, cross-disciplinary um, skill sets that interoperate. And so what you do is you move to a manufacturing model, industrial manufacturing processes. And software hasn't made that transition. In fact, if anything, the guild model is being reinforced through things like Agile, where basically anyone who's got some sense of oversight is now excluded from the process because the developer is wagging the dog from the bottom up. And um, it's really a wrong way to do it. You need to have oversight of the, the these systems we're trying to build are very complex. And unless you have proper engineering, proper manufacturing types of... Uh, it's actually very interesting. There's a direct connection to the history of computer science. So everybody's heard of Charles Babbage. And everybody knows Babbage invented the first feasible computing machine. But not many people remember that Charles Babbage actually made his fortune by writing um, extremely, incredibly well-received um, and very popular bestseller in about the 1820s. And he basically went around to this new form of manufacturing that was emerging. And he documented it and he articulated and said, these are how you do the process of moving to manufacture. And he wrote the world's best business book. And he made his fortune from doing that. And it's, it's interesting because he, you know, he started from the process point of view and then moved to computation. I think computation needs to look at that transformation and say, how do we do that really properly? Because we're wasting so much effort and missing out on, we could be doing much bigger, more valuable things with our time than just code smithing. And so is that, is that just an efficiency argument? No, it's, it's actually a functional argument. I think you can build better and more powerful things when you, when you step away from that. In fact, the, re the reason you can do that is you realise that the, the machine that we program, the, the reason people call themselves coders is because they are encoding Turing machines. That's what it actually means. And they live within the tape of the Turing machine. It doesn't matter what language you have. They're all exactly equivalent. And they're basically, they, they're specialists in moving the Turing tape up and down the tape in certain ways. But they live on the Turing tape. But actually, when you look at systems like the web, the web is a system where you're, nobody ever went to the web and said, I really want to make that Turing tape move. We don't care about the Turing tape. We care about obtaining a valid state for a given resource that we want to interact with. And we do not care. It could come from a cache in the browser, or it could come from a CDN Akamai on the edge, or it could come from... We care about valid state. We don't care about computation in real world systems. And in fact, what that, the reason that works is essentially the web fundamentally is not Turing, like in the sense of the Turing machine is a deterministic model for computation and you have to move the tape up and down the head in a certain way. The web is a non-deterministic system. It says, I hope that I can find a route to get me a valid state in a non-deterministic way. But what you care about is not how the computation performs, the but result. is the result valid. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. 
Okay, very much on the tech in TechFin or FinTech, but any, anyone here want to comment on that or raise a question? So certainly one of the things that occurred to me when you were talking about a move to kind of essentially a more industrially oriented production of code is the extent to which um, code, in, in my limited experience, code in fintech or tech fin, code in the financial sector, um, is put together by cowboys. Uh, so um, the, the amount of safety engineering that goes and, and quality assurance that goes into uh, production level code, certainly um, in, at the system level, is really poor in comparison to other truly safety critical systems approaches. So if you look at aerospace or if you look at nuclear engineering, there's an awful lot of testing before the system goes live and, and, the, and people worry about systemic effects. But if you look at the last 10 years, the kind of normalization of flash crashes from the, the first big one on May the 5th, 2010, through to the Stirling crash of, of last year, almost always they're attributed to, to automated systems. And so here we're, we're coming around to Alistair's claim that, you know, we're all going to be out of a job. But the trouble is, is that if we invest trust in automated systems which are produced via the kind of the guild model of, of co-production, I guess there's then a question of are we cruising for trouble? Are we, are, you know, the, the next financial crisis that um, the previous panellist advertised as uh, the thing that we're due, something that might come, might actually be caused not by human interactions within the financial markets, but by machine interactions in the financial markets because we've devolved so much autonomy and so much power and control mm -hmm. to automated systems that we don't fully understand the system level interactions of. Obviously, within any one institution, you can test your trader, your automated trading system or your automated financial system to the nth degree, but what happens when it then goes live in the market is dependent on your competitors and, and other factors beyond your control. So yeah, and you, you're getting close to that criticality by putting in machine learning algorithms in there as well, because they obviously they don't, they can't learn for the um, exception case, and the exception case will happen. Indeed. Mm. So, yeah. yeah, so here we come on to artificial intelligence, machine learning, the evil revolution, the end of <laughs> capitalism. Uh, but is it, is it necessarily an unalloyed good? I mean, uh, th th again, if, if you want to raise money, it's very easy to get VC funding for AI machine learning in the financial markets. But um, I worry, given that it's something I've worked on for 20 years, that there's an awful lot of hype and an awful lot of hope, and people aren't maybe as attendant as they should be to the downside risk. Alistair, I wonder, I wonder if you've got anything to say about that. Uh, well, uh, firstly, I mean, the, it's useful to, to differentiate between what is machine learning, which is uh, sort of mainstream going on a lot at the moment. Statistics done on the map. Yep, statistics. Yeah. Uh, there's deep learning, which is more sort of neural network type stuff. Mm -hmm. um, which actually there's a lot of that going on as well, exploiting resources in the cloud, what have you. Um, and then true general purpose AI, which is still a fair way out. Uh, yeah. I mean, you've, you see a lot of AI-like stuff going on, but it's not really sort of general purpose, genuine learning. Mm -hmm. um, so those are all going to have uh, a major effect on society and, and the way stuff is done, because it will lead to automation, it will lead to processes we don't understand anymore. Uh, you know, inputs will go in and something comes out the other end, but you won't necessarily understand why or mm -hmm. what it is. I mean, there was a there was a pretty scary experiment that Google did where they had uh, they did the sort of uh, Alice talking to Bob with uh, the middleman listening, mm -hmm. and Alice was talking to Bob over conventional um, encryption mechanisms, and then they then uh, came up with um, uh, their own encryption mechanism, which the uh, the AI interceptor couldn't crack anymore. And then you get to a point where machines actually worked out a way of talking to each other that nobody can understand. Um, and so, but that's a slight side. But so we're going to end up with automation, generally speaking. Uh, that means, uh, and you know, we're not just talking about blue collar type jobs, we're talking about white collar type stuff. Absolutely, yeah. You start looking at news aggregation today, and you get news items come out, and you read it, and you think, bloody hell, a robot's written this, because mm -hmm. it's so slotting awful. It's, it's, it's so formulaic, mm -hmm. you can, you can mm -hmm. spot it a mile off. Uh, and that's just creeping in everywhere. You'll always um, be able to spot the machine, though, because they won't use profanities. It's only a matter of time. It's three lines of code, and I can make my machine swear <laughs> like a That's, that's I mean, about your limit, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, three lines of code is my limit, yeah. But I think, I mean, I thought it was interesting that in the ethics panel that we just had, the conversation was very much focused on the ethics of the finances and the kind of financial interactions that a company was affecting and not on the ethics of the... So it was the ethics of the fin, not of the tech, whether you're talking about fintech or tech fin. Mm -hmm. So, and, and certainly when Phil Bates from Oracle was sat here 
he he was um, he was he seemed fairly relaxed about the idea of technology replacing people, but. Uh, it's certainly the case that it's happened. So the little vignette from my own career is I'd, I joined Deutsche Bank in 2005 as an FX trader and we had about 30 spot FX traders and my boss told me that um, three years previously there had been 90 and they, they had been reduced to 30 because we now had software that was doing the jobs of the people and the head of the trading floor would occasionally come over bringing an important guest and say, Dave, tell your joke. And then I would stand up and have to tell my joke. And my joke was, if I did my job, and in fact, this is, this is an old HP line, um, but if I did my job correctly, uh, in five years' time, the trading floor at Deutsche Bank would be one big computer, one dog, and one person. Uh, the computer would do all the trading, the dog would make sure no one touches the computer, and the person would feed the dog. Um, and about four years after I left uh, Deutsche, I bumped into someone who I used to work with, and I said, so, you know, is it true? How many spot traders are there now in foreign exchange? Um, and I meant in London, and he answered four. And I said, wow, four in London? Like, there used to be 20, 30. And he said, no, four globally. Uh, so there's basically one person per time zone looking after the machines which are doing the trading. Mm -hmm. and, and in spot effects, that's fairly easy. But for, for more complex derivatives, it's only a matter of time before those kind of transitions happen. And when those transitions happen, there are ethical questions about what you're doing to people's jobs and what you're doing to the stability of the system mm -hmm. that I think are as important as the ethics of where your clothes come from or, um, mm. or the, the nature of the financial transactions that your company is involved in. Question here. Yeah, so, um, you know, systems tend to be robust. Oh, sorry, if you could wait for the mic. Okay. So, systems tend to be robust if they're diverse, you know. Ecosystems tend to be robust if you have a large number of species which can occupy the same niche and have niche overlap. Um, but it seems to me that the tendency within um, extremely competitive development environments like that would be towards one algorithm that rules them all, yeah? Uh, essentially, because why do you want to be doing anything which is suboptimal? Yeah. So, so, so is this inherently a fragile system which is, which is inevitably going to fall apart? Well, I think. Sorry, I'm supposed to be the, I'm to be the, I'm to be the chair. Uh, well, so I think I think in automated trading in the financial markets, the particular thing is that actually artificial intelligence counted for almost nothing for a very long time because it was about a race to zero latency. So you might have a Fields Medal in mathematics, and I, I might have failed my high school maths. But if I can trade before you, I've eaten your lunch because by the time you've come to the market, the market's yeah. changed by my actions. So everyone was just everyone was keen to cut everything to to the bone. So that it wasn't necessarily being clever, it was just being super fast. And then people were taking their algorithms and encoding them in FPGAs, casting it into silicon, so that you could cut out a whole bunch of stuff. And that, you know, so then basically you've got a bunch of really stupid stuff working as quickly as possible, working at speeds that humans can't intervene in or even comprehend what's going on, which is probably quite a lot of what went wrong on, um, on May the 5th, 20, 2010. Um, but yeah, the... the there's a, there's a convergence towards technology solutions that means that there's a lack of diversity, which means that if there is a vulnerability in the one, in the one approach that everyone's using, then you have a systemic vulnerability that could be catastrophic. Yeah. Vulnerability, yeah. However, uh, more on AI. Any more questions on AI automation? Hello. If we can have the microphone. Can I put your question back to you on, in respect of derivatives then? If, as you said, we, we should stop trading derivatives because we don't understand them. Oh, that was Pete's point. That was Pete, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry. Should we stop creating artificial intelligence in computing systems if we don't understand the inputs, processes, and outputs? Question for you, Pete. Well, I, I don't have any um, moral authority. I just asked the question. But <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm prepared to pontificate at length on any subject. So <laughs> just give me it. Uh, I, I think there are questions about boundaries, aren't there? I mean, obviously, there's a, there's a good and a bad in everything. There will be good benefits from artificial intelligence, obviously. But then there are extremes, and when you take something to extreme, it can be used for, for nefarious purposes. And I don't know how you define that, that boundary, but it's, mm. it's necessary to consider it and, and have some determination of it. Christina, did you have a view on this? Yeah, well, um, I, I completely agree with you. And... Um, hearing what all of you are saying it just reminded me of um, an interesting I would 
say it was a meeting with um, a robot called Sophia. I'm, I'm sure that some of you might have read something about it in the media. It's a company called SingularityNet that um, have created a robot. So if you have seen humans and Westworld, this is what Sophia looks like. And it was crazy. I was literally scared to be sat next to AI machine that looks exactly like us. Even when you touch it, it feels like a human and then ask irrelevant questions, uh, questions about emotions, questions about um, complete algorithms to be put in place and you could actually hear logical answers to your questions. And I thought that we're five years away from that, but it's happening now. And it's interesting because already um, people from the military, a lot of people from aviation, banks as well, had approached the company to work together in projects. And the end goal is to have those robots put in place in two years' time, which is insane. Mm -hmm. so, well, it's, yeah, I mean, AI obviously has potential dangers. Um, it's probably something we ought to be careful about. But like everything we do, we're just going to rush into it and we'll see what comes out the other end, because that's what we do as humans. So I'll see you the other side. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm an optimistic guy, though. I like to think my glass is half full. Um, so I quite look, look forward to a world, hopefully I'll be alive, when we're not all just robots ourselves, working away to earn currency to basically make our lives comfortable, but we're actually just leaving it all to machines and automation and actually we're just having human interaction talking about culture and art and basically having so you should look at charles's ted, ted talk charles radcliffe who was on before he's he's got a very good um argument about about how to actually achieve that and which mm. which industries should be automated for the for the good for yeah. the net good and yeah. does it include finance I don't actually know. It's, oh, not yeah, be, it's not on TED yet, but he, okay. did, he gave it last week in Bristol. It right. was very well received. So, mm. Yeah, I mean, certainly there, there are authors like um, uh, Brynjolfsson and McAfee who have been talking about the second machine age and uh, uh, the Suskins, Suskin and Suskin talking about um, the future of work and you know, the robot revolution. Uh, uh, and they seem to be very... Um, you know, they, they think very carefully about the implications of automation and uh, and machine learning, big data technology on the world of work. And then there are the kind of the people who are a little bit more extreme, uh, in my opinion. So, so like Kurzweil, and he's you know, when I first started studying AI in '87, Kurzweil was warning us about the singularity is only 20 years away, and it's been 20 years away forever. And I don't think we have to worry too much about that. But I think. Um, I mean, I think the other thing that was interesting about some of the previous panels was the way in which no one's really yet mentioned politics. So, so regulation is just seen as something that's imposed almost you know, externally. And yet, actually, uh, the, Charles's claim that we're due another financial crisis worries me because I don't think politicians did anything about the last one. And if we have another one, they'll just, they'll just bend over and take whatever the world of finance <laughs> says again, just like they did the first time. Um, and unfortunately, we were going to have a politician, Thangam Debonair was going to be here, but she can't make it, is that correct? Uh, Parliament's sitting at the moment. So yeah. Don't... So, um, you know, is there, is there a, a, a... Should there be an agenda for dealing with politicians, educating politicians, so that they make the laws that then form the regulations that TechFin and FinTech works within? Is this, is this something we care about, or do we just assume that politicians will get it right? I once had a very entertaining um, meeting with a politician at HP Labs, and it was um, the science minister, Lord Sainsbury. Yeah, David He Sainsbury. came along, and I was working on um, some, uh, it was actually rights management distributed sharing. And I had the great pleasure of saying, now you'll understand this, it's peer-to-peer -peer technology. Oh. <laughs> And he didn't understand. It was better when you he were swearing. He didn't even did. understand yeah. the joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so I mean, so for instance, for as long as we, you know, on the assumption that we're still in Europe uh, for the next couple of years, um, Mifid, the, Mo the Market in Financial Instruments Directive, second edition, Mifid two, is is you know is reshaping the world of finance and the way technology is applied in finance. But if you if you look at what MIFID 2 says about algorithmic trading or automated trading, it's like it was written by someone who hasn't got a GCSE in computer science. 
uh, and it's because the, very often the text for these uh, these Europe-wide laws are written by U MEPs, European politicians, with minimal technical input. And if the technical input contradicts what they want to write, they ignore the technical input. And I, I know that from first-hand experience. So I think I would say uh, that um, one, of the, one of the agendas for the future should be working with politicians to educate them to what the possibilities are and what the dangers are in order that they can make informed opinion so that we have informed regulation. Because regulation doesn't come from nowhere. But the earlier discussion on regulation just seemed to, you know, I'm just a regulator, I just, uh, I just, I just enforce the rules. Do you think that's possible, though? Uh, well, I think it... It is, yeah, I think it is. Other, well, otherwise, you're, you're forever cleaning up after the last catastrophe. And, and anticipatory regulation doesn't strike me as impossible. Uh, I mean, it certainly, uh, there, are, there are other applications of technology to society where it does happen. Although, for, for, for many fields, you can, you can say, well, actually, there were some number of catastrophes before the regulation came in. Mm. Pharmaceuticals, nuclear power, air crashes, so on. There's a, there's a question right down the front. Yes. So just going back to the point about uh, cross-discipline module, um, and then regards to the, your, your, your point about uh, the influence on legislation. So in a cross-discipline module, I mean, I'm sure that the specialists tend to be very narrow focused into their specialities so they can really focus on the depth and uh, the width of their the, the career focus. Um, at which point do you think then broadening what they know, so that they can engage with, so that they can engage with the wild, with the wider society in ex in exploring new ways of uh, innovation, of which part of that could be linked with government or it could be linked with school. Um, but if those specialists don't have the time, or they're not making the time, to engage with with communities and uh, schools or politicians, because they focus on driving this creativity and making it work and this competitive edge and how much can they make? Um, wh where do you see the potential of a cross-discipline uh, module? And then a question to yourself is, where is the potential for tech to really be engaged more with uh, younger people so that legislation could be in, uh, uh, implemented from that strategy as opposed with politicians who themselves are quite distant from the young people? So, you know, I'll leave that to you. Yes, yeah, so... Um I think it's very interesting. It's, again, it's a material property. When you look at the way we put software together now, the material, you, in order to impose regulatory truth, you have to have um, some ability to introduce constraints and say the system is within the accepted constraints and therefore we're comfortable with it, we're confident of it, or it's outside of those constraints. And at the moment, um, software is bounded by decisions about constraints that go right through into the very internals of the, of the code, you know, even to the low-level things about defining what type some information needs to be. And in fact, to solve the problem successfully, what you need to do is, is what happens in physics systems, which is you don't worry about the detail of the inside. You worry about the boundary conditions. And you apply, you look at the edge states. And as long as you can understand the edge, and the edge is consistent to whatever the constraints are, the system will then, if, if you, you, know, you know what's going on, will behave within those constraints. So in order to do successful regulatory compliance and, and policy, you actually have to have specialists in engineering the constraints of systems. And at the moment, we don't have that discipline. There isn't someone who's, who is a constraint engineer. You can't say, I want to be a constraints engineer and really understand the regulatory compliance and really understand what it means and what it means to the data and the architecture and then impose that constraint and, and be able to be... Actually, it's about accountability. You need somebody to be able to point at and say, you screwed up, or I would have used this more strong profanity. Thank, thank you. Thank you. See how moderate I'm becoming. I screwed up. Um, because you need to be able to point the finger because it's about, you know, Constraint, uh, uh, regulate, regulation, compliance ultimately is about, um, has to be enforceable, and the only way it can be enforceable is to hold people to account. Mm -hmm. And, you know, unless you've got somebody you can point at and say, you really did, you had to do that job and you didn't do that job, and the system is not valid, you can't do it. And we don't have, we don't organize our software in a way that allows that to happen. And so our software and our systems 
are unconstrained, uncontrolled. And what I what I find, we're working in with tier one investment banks. We're building supercomputer architectures to calculate um, derivative prices, and they're really very very big. Uh, systems, but they're doing very simple things. They're just doing Monte Carlo simulations over derivative prices. And um, it's just the scale that's in interesting. But what you find is that the regulator has good intent, wants to impose some requirement, but they're always ahead of the ability of the technology guys to, to catch up. And so you never actually get synchronicity between the regulator and the actual system. And so then you end up with like what Charles said, which is we're not here to comply with the regulator. We're here to explain to them why we can't comply with the regulator. Yeah. That's insane, isn't it? Christina, did you, did you want to respond to this? I'm just going to pass on that okay. one. Okay. Uh, well, picking up on the point about uh, getting the younger generation involved, I mean, I think we've got to stop this sort of criminal thing that goes on at the moment, which is where we teach uh, information technology in schools as this is how you use a spreadsheet, this is how you use a Word document, uh, and this is how you use PowerPoint. And that's pretty much it at the moment. Um, and we've got to get a lot more creative in terms of what in, uh, information technology is about, um, and essentially engender creativity. Um, and I think you know, young minds actually pick up on information technology really easily. A lot of them enjoy it. Uh, they might not think they're a natural, but actually if they're just naturally creative, they lend themselves towards it anyway. Uh, and that's probably where we need to go. We all went, we went wrong when we put C in the middle of IT. Yeah. Why the heck do you want to put information communication? To, it's a tautology. Of course, you've got to, if you've got information, you have to communicate. So you don't need to say communication. Really okay, we're, bear, we're running out of time. Ridiculous. Uh, and the longer Pete talks, the more risk goes he's going to swear again. Uh, so um, <laughs> so as, if anyone's got any last burning Thanks, question, any, any point they want to raise, any point they want to make, any contradiction they want to interject, no. In that case, I'm going to ask each of the panellists for one prediction for 10 years out, because this is supposed to be the future. <laughs> the thing is, the likelihood of us coming back and cashing in that prediction <laughs> in 10 years is vanishingly small. I've already said the singularity. I reckon it's 20 years away. Um, <laughs> uh, well, it's going to be quantum computing. It's going to destroy encryption which is the fundamental aspect of we, the, the, the foundation of all of our financial transactions. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you better start thinking of an alternative. Fantastic. Quickly. Thank you. Yeah. I definitely think that AI and, uh, and moving into the whole new of world of cryptocurrencies is the next thing, and it's going to happen before the, those 10 years have passed. Okay. Thank you very much. Pete? I think we'll have a repeat of the category era of breaking things down into small parts thinking that's the way of solving problems. We did it with Corba, we did it with SOA, we're doing it with microservices uh, because it is good to break things down to small parts. And the reason it's good to break things down to small parts is not the small parts, no one cares about the small parts. All people care about is being able to spontaneously combine them in creative ways to get something that's greater than some of the parts. So nobody cares about atoms, people care about molecules. And molecules have value. And we're going to have a car crash in microservices just like we had in all the others because the coders want to turn it into code again and they're going to start building microservices that are basically APIs talking code. And it will just won't work because they keep doing the same thing. They did it, they've done it twice, they're going to do it a third time. And then hopefully we'll say three times, why isn't this working? And we'll think about it differently. Okay. On that note, let's thank our panel. Thanks very much. And now someone's going to say something that isn't, hello, my name's Thangan. Yeah. <laughs> well, well spotted. We always knew it was going to be a risk inviting a, a politician to do the closing address because it turns out that Parliament is sitting um, and Thangan is uh, responsible for the bill that's currently going through. So unfortunately, she is still in London. Um, however, before I hand over to um, Adrian to do a, a quick summary of today, I just wanted to thank everyone again for coming along. Um, and especially to Womblebond Dickinson and Hargreaves Lansdowne, our sponsors, to the extended uh, community that supported putting this event together, um, and also to our special interest group um, with Adrian, Nick, Dave, um, Nick, uh, Derek, and several other people I've probably forgotten, who over the last 18 months have, have helped to shape what today is. Um, we are thinking about 
Bristol Tech Fin 2018. So do fill out the, the feedback forms. Feed the feedback monster. Your input is important. It will be included um, and taken into account for next year. Um, so before I release you all to the bar and this evening's uh, enjoyment on wa Waterside, um, I'd like to hand over to Adrian just to say a few words of closure um, and to close the, the conference for today. Thank you. Adrian. don't have the dubious honour of listening to me. No, you do. Um, I'm very happy and thankful to, to John for uh, dropping me in this. So bear with me. It's not going to take the full half hour that we'd set aside for, for Thangham. So we're in Bristol. We're talking about tech fin, fintech. It's been used interchangeably. Why Bristol? Why tech fin? John gave a pretty good overview at, at the beginning, but let me just take you through um, the four panels and some of the thoughts that I hope represent why. So in the first panel, we had cutting edge deployment of uh, current financial technology. We had the likes of Starling Bank along. Uh, we had Nick Sturge from uh, the Engine Shed. Uh, Derek Ahmadazai from FunSurfer, a plethora of, of really interesting people. Their key comments were, well, early adopters, they're in the minority. Why should we care? James from True Digital gave us this perspective. It's about shifting inertia. Now, how do you do that? The key point is through communication. Communication not of the benefits, because a whole host of startups will tell you all about their, their latest and best and how they're going to be better than everyone else. Um, it's actually about the communication of the pain points, um, of not changing. What's going to happen if you don't change? What are you going to potentially miss out on? What is the disadvantage, um, the financial pain that you might endure? Um, there is a really interesting point on since the financial crisis, 10 years, the iPhone versus banking regulation, the amount of good that um, the app-based iPhone has enabled us uh, to live through being a professional photographer, um, being able to manage your, your finances on the go, um, being able to sign up to insurance by the 15-minute interval. Um, but in contrast to that, what's banking regulation done? It's pretty much dampened everything. It's stopped innovation, some might say. So in the second panel on innovation and regulation, we heard uh, two of the regulators seeking to, to address that, saying, well, actually, we've, we've, we're trying to develop regulation that is based on uh, model-driven machine readable legislation. So it enables a far more efficient process. But there are probably dangers within that as well. Um, the risk of automation and increased speed, less friction, potentially brings about um, an increasing frequency of flash crashes um, or other uh, things that we can't yet foresee. So. Uh, Holly Powley from the University of Bristol made a very good point of continuously challenging what we are doing, the way that we're innovating, the way that we're regulating. It's about communication. It's about having that dialogue and, and getting people involved. So it's not about being um, the perfect regulation. It's about the being fit for purpose instead of complex regulation. Dave Tong made that point. It's not about you know, the layers upon layers of, of regulation so that we as lawyers can get rich. I mean, that's a nice side point. But, um, and on that note, we moved into ethical finance. And when Nick, Jaya, um, and, uh, and Charles, and they, where they touched on uh, what it means to have ethical finance. Now, we're in Bristol, and uh, Bristol is a fairly liberal city, to, to put it mildly. Um, 
But what they teased out was that it's going to be a fairly long journey. It's a, it's, you can't guarantee end-to-end -end ethical finance. It's impossible. But you can enhance transparency through initiatives such as B Corps um, and providing the data to allow people to scrutinize and develop an ethical framework that can be challenged over time. Be the change and persistently ask questions. And then we moved on into um, a really interesting uh, blue skies finance, not quantum, uh, panel. It started with capitalism is dead <laughs> and things need to change. Distributed ledger technology, blockchain, ICOs, they're not the, uh, the magic pill. It's not going to solve all of our, our worries, but they are the start. They're, they're the beginning of hopefully something that is transformational. And a key point here that ties into the ethical uh, banking aspects was ethics of tech is just as important as ethics of the fin. You know, we come back to uh, Dave's joke about one computer, one dog, and one human. That's one worth bearing in mind. And also, and this is why perhaps it's good that Thangham isn't here, the role of politicians and the need to educate them so that they can enact proportionate, appropriate legislation that doesn't curtail innovation that works with the innovation um, instead of killing it. So why Bristol? Why, fin, uh, why TechFin? Is it a FinTech cluster? Right, Samir and I have had this discussion uh, at the APPG on, on FinTech at the AGM, you know, justifying Bristol's role, maybe. Are there financial services experts within the city? through the likes of Hargreaves Lansdowne, one of our, our sponsors, um, through the likes of Lloyd's having their, their massive back office systems here, through the likes of NatWest and their dig digital innovation studio that is seeking to completely reinvent their whole structure. Um, I could go on. I would say we probably have a certain FS expertise, but others may say maybe. We're not the FinTech leaders, but we have leaders in cloud with Oracle's um, cloud platform, open banking with the likes of MoneyHub and Dave Tong, who's persistently engaged with, uh, with the open banking implementation entity and the hours of, of very, very boring conversations, according to him. Um, we have ethics and transparency through TISC reports. We've got uh, Charles Radcliffe as the data philosopher posing really intelligent questions that keep us seeking to challenge the truth and, and learn. Um, we've got the likes of edge computing and, um, and distributed com computing out of uh, Silicon Sodbury. So the point here is, yeah, we've got a, a fairly good mix here in Bristol. We've got a fair amount to share with uh, the world of of, or the UK fintech scene um, because we have the tech capacity to develop and support the tech infrastructure in financial services, but key, not just financial services, beyond, because we all know that technology is sector agnostic. The singularity is 20 years away. Quantum will destroy encryption. AI and cryptocurrencies will exist within 10 years. And it is important to break things down into small parts and spontaneously combine them to generate huge value. My overall view of this whole thing is that in the end, it comes down to people, culture and values. So I'm going to leave you, and you'll soon be released for your beer and wine, with Tim Minchin's nine lessons, and I'm not going to read them all out because I think that was a 10 minute speech, but I think this encapsulates Bristol TechFin pretty appropriately. Which is, 
you don't have to have a dream. So there's a number of speakers here that said, yeah, okay, by all means, have a dream, but do what is in front of you at, at the, this point in time. It's what Jaya probably would hopefully uh, uh, agree with in terms of my question of how do you actually solve it? How do you bring about that change? Well, it's not about end to end. It's about doing what you can to advance the, uh, a solution to the problem. Remember, it's all luck. And uh, that's a certain existential aspect, which is to say that we're all a bunch of experts holding out that we, we know exactly what we're talking about, but really, it's all the end result of our successes are all about the conversations that we have with people and being in the right place at the right time. So the more of a network that you can have and the more that you can interact and ask intelligent questions and challenge yourself and challenge others, the more likely that we're going to advance um, some of these ambitions that we, that we all hold. I'm going to pass on the exercise one because being in Bristol, you see everyone up and down on their bikes and running into work. Um, be hard on your opinions. We've heard a lot of opinions and I myself am extremely opinionated. Uh, but at the same time, it's really important to criticize every single belief that you hold as well as those around you so that hopefully you can come to an evolving consensus that never stops. Be a teacher. So we've had some phenomenal uh, views here and what I would hope is that you can take all of this away and spread it. If, it's, if it is your area, then I hope that you've gained something and, and that causes uh, you to be challenged, but also that you can take it elsewhere and, and spread the word. Um, and the key point here, I think, for working with, uh, with John and others in, in Bristol and trying to highlight the, the benefits of uh, the TechFin environment here is don't rush. We've got plenty of time to challenge ourselves and to work together, seek out the opportunities um, and be patient and let things evolve. So on that note, thank you for being patient with me. Um, I hope that you've learnt uh, plenty from uh, our, our esteemed panellists here and uh, I hope that you enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Well, um, if you'd like to find out more about what's happening after this event, please do get in touch. We will be briefing Fang on, on the key points from today as to help encourage uh, a little bit of political dialogue. Um, and we will be back uh, sometime around this time next year for Bristol Tech Fin 2018. So thank you very much for coming. Cheers.